Hey guys, major, 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 major news. Okay, so, wow, this just blew me out of my seat. Out of nowhere, Netflix just announced what is now my most anticipated anime of the friggin' year. The big effing news today, after waiting like 20 goddamn years. Oh wait, no, it's just been 13, but it feels like 20. Anyway, guys, Pluto is being adapted. And I know a lot of you have no idea what I'm talking about. You're going to say, what the hell is Pluto? And I'm not talking about Mickey Mouse's non-speaking dog that lives with him. Okay, I need to like jog my memory because I should know most of this. But to take this as broad as possible and then bring it back as specific as possible, let me introduce you guys to Naoki Urasawa. Naoki Urasawa is one of the rare living mangaka to earn the title of Grand Master in Japan. And I think this title is only held by like him and Uraki from Jojo and then like a bunch of dead mangaka like Ishinomori and Tezuka. But unlike the rest of them, he's unfortunately probably made the least manga out of all those guys. But the thing of it is, every time he does make a manga, he makes the most perfect manga you have ever witnessed with your eyes and brain. He's kind of like Quentin Tarantino. He's someone who doesn't work a lot, but when he does work, the world moves to the art he makes. And that being said, three of Urasawa's manga are regarded as absolute masterpieces, and all of them have gotten adaptations except Pluto. Pluto is the third and final Urasawa manga masterpiece that has never gotten an adaptation before now, and Netflix is finally doing it. And it looks amazing. Now, a little bit more backstory on Urasawa. So he became famous initially writing Master Keaton in the 80s. I've never read Master Keaton, but I hear that it was good enough that it like made him worldwide famous. Like it's what landed him on the pop culture landscape. But Urasawa himself has kind of mixed feelings on Master Keaton. He kind of is embarrassed of it now. So in 2012, he spent like two years re-editing and re-releasing like a tighter version of it. I haven't actually gotten around to checking out Master Keaton, but it is the first thing he ever did that I heard about it. And uh, that's what like introduced me to the guy. Anyway, let's talk about Pluto now. Pluto is a bizarre adaptation of Astro Boy. Actually, that's not true. Pluto is strictly an adaptation of the events of the 13th arc of Astro Boy, the greatest robot on Earth arc. And despite it being an adaptation of the events of that story, it's a completely new story because it's told from a completely different point of view and it's got a completely different tone. It takes what was like initially a goofy, happy Astro Boy like tournament arc and it turns it into a dark, gritty, cyberpunk detective noir murder story told from the perspective of a minor character named Gesicht. I don't know if I'm saying that right, it's very German. But anyway, he's a European detective robot and in the original arc, he's strictly this minor background character who just shows up and doesn't do much. But now they flip the tables where it's all about this guy and it's not about Astro Boy at all. So Astro Boy doesn't really heavily factor in the story except for in the end when things finally like sync up with like the original story. Now, I can't begin to break down how insane this fucking thing is. Like, the Pluto arc in the original Astro Boy was probably the longest individual st story arc in the original Astro Boy. Like, I have to estimate just based on the other Astro Boy stories, it's like seven or ten times longer than them. But Pluto, on the other hand, is like a full-blown odyssey into madness. Like, Pluto has an insane 65 volumes on just this one story arc. And I can't begin to, like, explain how nuts this is. I can't even, like, compare this to anything, like, in the West. There's no equivalent of this. It's insanely specific how specific this all is. It's like if Quentin Tarantino's last movie was a nine hour long film noir adaptation of the Cell Saga from Dragon Ball Z told entirely from the perspective of Tian Shinhan, who, you know, just kind of found out about Cell in the middle of all the shit that was going on because no one cares about him. Anyway, back to this Netflix adaptation. This looks hot as hell. So your next question is maybe going to be why now? Well, I'll tell you why now. So, to tell you why it's happening now, we have to go back to the miserable year of 2009, where in 2009, a really bad Astro Boy movie came out. I don't know if you guys have seen this Astro Boy movie, but Astro Boy wears a hoodie in it. 
there's nothing redeeming about this movie except for maybe the fact that Nicolas Cage plays a really bad and really weird Nicolas Cage rendition of Dr. Tenman in it. So this movie comes out at almost the exact same time that Pluto just finishes its monumental manga run. It wins all the awards, it gets worldwide acclaim, and everyone agrees that Urasawa has done it again. This is his third manga masterpiece. And everyone was like so psyched about it. Everyone wanted to adapt it. Everyone just wanted to see this like story come to fruition. But at the same time, the bad CGI Astro Boy movie comes out in Hollywood. And the bad CGI Astro Boy movie does incredible harm to the Astro Boy franchise in the West and potentially all over the world because there hasn't been anything new with Astro Boy since that movie until now. So here's what else happened back in 2009. Exactly right before this awful movie came out. Uh, you guys know Illumination, you know, Universal, the Minions people who are now doing the Mario movie. So they snagged up all of the international rights for Pluto. So they now had exclusive rights to it. That meant no one else could do a live action adaptation of it and no one else could do an anime adaptation of it because I believe their intention was to do it as a CG animated movie, like I guess the Minions, but way more serious. But at the same time, like right after this deal was inked, CG Astro Boy movie comes out and it bombs so hard that it kills the studio that produces it. And so Illumination gets cold feet. And so they decided to do nothing with the rights. They literally sat on them for an entire goddamn decade until their deal just expired up in smoke. And finally, the rights go back to Urasawa, and I'm guessing he gave them to Netflix, which is why we're suddenly getting this anime Netflix adaptation now. And holy shit, it's delivering it. It actually has the exact same visual quality of the badly localized 2004 adaptation of Astro Boy, but with Urasawa's more mature characters, tone, and like character designs. So I'm into this. Like, Wow, I can't believe this is finally happening, and I'm so, so happy it's finally happening. This is, this is the best thing to happen all, like, week. Alright, well, anyway, I think that's all I have to say about Pluto today, but hey, since the topic's just come up, why don't we talk some more about Naoki Urasawa? You guys want to know more about him? Let's talk about his other two masterpieces. Alright, so the first masterpiece of Naoki Urasawa, and the one that most people have seen, is Monster. Monster immediately got localized back in the day for the Sci-Fi Channel in the US, but then after it aired on Sci-Fi and came out on DVD, it's been unavailable for like almost a decade. Thankfully, like literally this year, Netflix recently bought back the rights for it. Maybe that was setting the groundwork for them adapting Pluto, or at the very least, maybe that influenced them in the decision to do it. But anyway, Monster is a crazy movie or a crazy manga rather let me try to tell you guys from my memory the story of monster so monster is a dark horror psychological thriller and it asks a really simple question if you were a doctor would you save the antichrist if he was your patient that's the basic gist of the story and i think it's more of a spin on the old arguments about would you kill hitler if hitler was a baby because Monster is set in 1990s Germany, so like it's like a little bit tinged with those old like Nazi references. But anyway, it's the story about a Japanese surgeon named Dr. Tenma. By the way, that's another Astro Boy reference because that's the same name as like Astro Boy's Dr. Tenma. Anyway, so Dr. Tenma one day has to operate on this boy who's been shot in the head by his parents. But the boy hasn't died yet. He's just in a coma. And Dr. Tenma is the world's most proficient brain surgeon. So only he can save this boy. But before he does it, I think he's warned by the cops that the boy's parents shot him because they were very sure that this boy was the Antichrist. Now, Dr. Tenma is an atheist. He doesn't believe in the Antichrist. So he obviously does the surgery and he saves the boy's life. But uh-oh, bad news. Turns out the kid actually is the Antichrist. So then the kid pretty much recovers and instantly destroys Dr. Tenma's life. Like, I forget the specifics of how he does this, but he, like, pretty much murders everyone Dr. Tenma knows, and he causes him to lose his job, and then he turns Dr. Tenma into this, like, stark raving mad hobo. So Dr. Tenma is now this, like, homeless recluse, and he decides to dedicate the rest of his life 
to undoing that surgery he did and eventually killing the Antichrist. Drama ensues. I'm pretty sure some Nazis show up because we're in Germany and then the Mafia gets involved. I think there was a midget at some time. Anyway, I forget how it ends, but eventually maybe he kills the Antichrist or something. Maybe the Antichrist just dies of something else. I don't know. It's definitely one of those stories that is better at the start of it than the end of it. But anyway, the anime adaptation is perfect. So if you guys really care, get on Netflix and go watch the anime like right now. Now, that being said, the anime made a huge impact on the West back in the day. And there's been so much of a deal that the anime was so good that Gilmore Dotoro was attached to do a live action adaptation of it. Oh, wait, shit, that got made? Whoa, I thought this never got made, but apparently Del Toro actually made it. But he didn't release it as a movie. He produced it as a pilot and he pitched it to HBO in 2013, but then HBO passed on it. And he apparently tried to pitch it to other studios, but I guess no one ever wanted it. Holy lost media, Batman. I need to see this now. Whoa, I didn't know this was done. All right, well, that's going to haunt me. Anyway, let's move on to the final masterpiece of Naoki Urasawa, 20th Century Boys. So Pluto is an epic murder mystery about Astro Boy, and Monster is an epic murder mystery about the Antichrist. So what do you guys think 20th Century Boys is about? But it's not another murder mystery, but it is kind of a mystery. Anyway, 20th Century Boys is on another level. Like, to describe the story as simply as possible, it's a multi-generation story, kind of like the way JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is, and it's about these kids that, in the 1960s, grew up to be these losers and failures. But then the main crux of the story is that one of those kids from this group of kids grew up as an exception to his peers. This one kid grows up to be the world's first and most evil supervillain in history. And then after the, the story is just peppered with like these weird references to like 60s and 70s otaku culture, classic rock music, and all this insane, intense like series of events and drama that goes down. Like it's hard to break down how intense and crazy the story is, but the story is mostly about the rise of the supervillain named Friend and how normal people allowed him to gain power and also how only normal people can stop him. And Friend as a supervillain is just crazy. Like he's established in this world as the first ever supervillain in history. But legitimately, there's only two things about him that really make him a supervillain. Number one, he wears this weird Cobra Commander style mask with like his icon on it. And number two, in the final arc when he finally takes over the world, he starts doing these like really childish things. Like he builds these like super weapon, but the super weapons are like modeled after like old school UFOs and like giganter villains and like other corny old fashioned shit. Like if you take away those two things, he's just a bizarrely normal fascist who rose to power in pretty much the style of your typical Japanese cult leader or retroactively pretty much exactly the way Vladimir Putin took over Russia and like later like became like a warlord. Like the main characters are driven insane by the knowledge that they know who this guy is, but they don't know exactly who this guy is. Like all his schemes like sync up disturbingly precisely with some goofy stories the kids wrote in elementary school. So they know they went to school with this guy, but they can't remember exactly who it is. So that's like the crux of the story. And it's just bizarre. Like one of the big centerpieces of the story is that friend rises up as like a cult leader and then he becomes a politician, but ultimately he's a supervillain, and he's like this weird sentimental retro otaku kind of a toy man kind of supervillain. So he like attacks Tokyo with a giant robot, but the giant robot he's like attacking Tokyo with is like trying to like act out an old episode of Gigantor. And then later on in the story, when he becomes like the full dictator of Japan, he establishes this group very intentionally modeled after the SSP from Ultraman, except they're this real government agency. And instead of fighting Kaiju, they're just your average deep state secret police who kill friends, political enemies. So it's like weird. They're like this like boring, like gruesome, normal thing. But then like he's like added this like otaku layer of paint to them to like make them look like the SSP. Like, honestly, I kind of love 20th Century Boys more than I love Pluto, 
But unfortunately, I would say 20th Century Boys is Urasawa's like most inapproachable work. Like it's the toughest one to comprehend because your only options for getting through it are either you collect the original manga, which has a not entirely terrible 24 volumes, or alternatively, you watch the mid 2000s uh, live action movies. So in the mid 2000s, just as the manga was concluding, they did these immediate Japanese live action film remakes and they're kind of a trilogy. Here's my quick uh, reviews of the trilogy. The first movie compresses down Kenji's entire story arc and I'm very mixed on it. Even though it goes through Kenji's story arc about as efficiently as possible, I feel like it's still too slow and too boring and I'm not satisfied with this movie. Like the movie has bad editing and I feel like they chose parts of the story badly. Like they chose the wrong stuff to keep and the wrong stuff to skip over. So the first movie is kind of sucky and it's like really a little bit boring and like hard to like keep my attention with. But that being said, if you can get through the first movie, the first movie flows perfectly into the second movie and the second movie is a masterpiece. It's so perfect. It's so good. Like I would almost say only watch the second movie, but the second movie doesn't make sense if you didn't watch the first movie. The second movie is entirely Kana's story arc, like the second big story arc of the story. And the second movie is just a masterpiece, especially if you watch it right after the first one. But it's tricky because the first movie kind of sucks, but you won't enjoy the second one if you didn't get all the backstory from the first one. So then after that, there's a third one to wrap up the story. And the third one, once again, kind of drops the ball again. It's not really satisfying like the second one was, and it has a lot of the same mistakes and problems that the first movie had. The third movie is set in the future, and now Friend has gone full supervillain. And a lot of his schemes are acted out with bad, unconvincing mid-2000 CGI. But yeah, that's unfortunately still the best we have for the story in terms of adaptation. Still though, if Pluto does really good while well Netflix, I'm still holding out a sliver of hope that we could eventually get an anime adaptation of 20th Century Boys. So don't write this one out because I think it's still in the works. But for now, uh, best you can do is probably watch the live action films if you really want to experience the story without reading or if you can't collect the manga. Just don't be surprised if you fall asleep in the first or the third movie. But anyway guys, those are the three masterpieces of Naoki Urasawa. Monster, 20th Century Boys, and Pluto. And now the time has finally come for me to sit back and watch the true to the original adaptation of Pluto, and I cannot freaking wait. All right guys, anyway, I was Buster Green, and uh, as always, I need to get my views up. I need to get more subscribers. Subscribe, watch my stuff for an hour today if you can. Thank you, I'm around. I've just been like really, really sick lately. I think I have like long-term COVID. I don't know what's wrong with me, but anyway, I'm going back to making my anime now. I'll talk to you guys later. Good night.